Okay, let's get this going. All right, guys, welcome to this week's lecture. Um, I hope you guys are doing well and everything is going good. I know last week we had off. I did go away on, uh, on Monday. I did post an assignment, so there was an assignment out there. For any of you guys that did not submit it yet, uh, please do so. This is a, a pro create a program that uses loops and conditional statements. We're gonna do some review on that today. Um, and we are quickly progressing into our first project. So the first project is going to be a basic platformer game where we're gonna create a, um, like a little Mario game, basically. Like a little guy that walks across the screen and he can jumps and, and things like that. Uh, so that's gonna help us work out some of these core concepts in some game development. We're gonna learn a little bit about uh, vectors and how to use them, what are they? It's a like crazy word. Um, some of the content here is gonna be inspired by some of the uh, content from the ITP program at NYU, which is given by uh, a really talented dude called Daniel Stiffman. Uh, he has a very popular YouTube channel that uh, goes over a lot of these concepts. Uh, I'll put a link down here uh, for that information. Um, we're gonna be nitpicking, basically taking apart some of, some of that content in this course. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and where is my screen share and i'm gonna share this screen here boom okay so you guys want to get logged into stack starter and you want to you should see this screen here i'm just get my face out of the way here so i can get to this and you should, you should only see one of these environments. So we've got ICG 350 here. And if we go ahead and click run, we should see this. And if we go ahead and click build, we should see our text editor. So where we left off, we basically reviewed how to connect JavaScript to our HTML in order to run both HTML and the JavaScript in the browser together. So if we go over to our sketch1.html, right? If I go here and say sketch1.html, you'll see here that we are running both this HTML here where it says hello again web and this particle system that looks like it's almost like snowing on the screen, which is kind of cool looking. We're gonna go ahead and basically break this apart a little bit and start over, create a new program and start building from there. Now I do want to mention too that you can work in groups for some of the stuff that we're going to be doing going forward. So I encourage you guys to do so if you want to break into groups, no bigger, no larger than three of you guys. Um, so you guys can work together on this. I encourage you to do that and you, you'll see as we work through some of these problems where some of that group collaboration can come, come in handy as we bring in maybe artwork and things like that. So, what we're gonna do here is, we're gonna go ahead and pop into our um, index.html. And you know what I'm gonna do? Instead of basically deleting this entire thing, I'm gonna rename it. So play along with me here. I'm gonna go ahead and right click and rename this. And I'm just gonna say, um, this is 3JS underscore demo. And this is basically what that is. It's a demo of 3JS. So now if we go back, and then take this sketch out and hit enter, it's gonna show us a directory listing of what we're serving up here. So it's not gonna render that index. So that's good because maybe we wanna see this so that we can navigate the files a little easier. So we could go here and click the sketch, we'll see this. We hit back, we can see the 3JS demo. Cool, awesome. So now let's go ahead and create a new file I'm gonna go back to our editor. I'm gonna go ahead and close this stuff. We don't need any of this, we don't need any of this. And I'm gonna create a new file and we're gonna call this file platformer.html. And now we have a blank HTML document. So as you may or may not recall from last semester, we need to now define the basic structure of an HTML document. So the first thing we're gonna start with is our doc type. And we're going to say doc type HTML. And then we're going to have to close that. Actually, we're missing some. It's doc type like that HTML. 
So now we've defined a HTML doc type and now the core sections of an HTML document. And you know what? I think I got to capitalize this. Why is it not like that? Why is my uh, editor not liking that? Let's go ahead and reference another one here. Capitalize doc type HTML. Ah, you know what? I'm, I'm, it's gotta be like that. There we go. So take those pieces out, doc type HTML. Typically when you're working with, um, with an editor, uh, these things are already filled out for you. So you're not gonna really be typing doc types too often. So this is basically just telling the browser that we're working in the newest version of HTML. So this is HTML version five. We do not need to declare an, a, an actual version here. Um, that tells the browser that, hey, we're working with HTML5. We can use cool things like our canvas element and our video element and things like that. So it's cool, there's some like embedded players and stuff. So now we need to define our parent element, which is HTML, right? And then the two other core elements to an HTML document are our head and our body, right? Just like a human being, we have a head and we have a body associated with our HTML document. Now in the head, we're gonna give it a title and we're gonna give the title of this a nice title of my platform game. And this is where we want to start bringing in some of our JavaScript. Now, what you can do is you can go to one of the, one of the files that we've already worked with, and you could just basically copy and paste this. So we're going to go ahead and copy and paste this script directive, and we're going to bring this right below the title right here. And instead of sketch, I'm going to call it platformer.js. We'll go ahead and save that. Now, we have basically a blank HTML document that's trying to link in a file called platformer.js. Now, is this gonna work? It's not, right? Because we don't have a platformer.js defined yet. So if we go ahead and actually try to run this and I click on platformer.js, we're not gonna see anything. And if we go ahead and open up our inspector, and we look at our console, it's going to say, hey, failed to load resource. The server responded with a status 404. Now, a 404 error is probably an error you've seen before on the internet. Basically means not found. Basically means, hey, I'm looking for something and I don't see it. So where is it? We need to actually create it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and add a new file. And we're going to call it platformer.js. Boom. Now, if we go back to here and hit refresh, we don't have that error anymore because it actually loaded the, the file. There's nothing in it yet, but it exists so we could see it. Let's go ahead and, and pop back to our editor. And I'm going to go ahead and just split the screen here because I want to see the actual execution is I'm going to turn this off as well. I have a little mobile testing going on there. We don't need that. And I'll pull this this way. And you know what? I don't think that's going to work because I'm only sharing my browser window. So I'll have to keep it like this. That's fine. Okay. So we have this there and we have this like this. Now, now we can define our P5JS sketch but we are missing something, right? So we brought in our platformer JS, but we wanna use P5 JS. Is this gonna work if I start to use P5 functions? Think about that for a second. We're only bringing in this. We're not bringing in P5 yet. Let's go ahead and try this out without bringing in P5 and see what happens. So. What are the two core functions we need to define our P5JS sketch? Remember, I drove this home in the first level course, which was quite some time ago now. You remember what those are? It's going to be our setup and our draw function, right? So we need those two functions to be able to create a new P5JS program. So let's go ahead and define that setup function first. So to define a function, we're going to say function. We're going to call it setup. We're going to open and close our parentheses, which is our parameter listing. In this case, 
there are no parameters. So we're, we're okay. Go ahead and open that up using our curly brackets. And now here is where we want to do a couple of things. And these couple of things are pretty consistent with creating a P5JS sketch. The first thing is like Bob Ross used to do, right? He used to set up his canvas on his easel and then just kind of paint over the whole easel with that white, right? What, the, what, what was his white's name? I forget now. I'm going to have to Google it right now because I need to say it. Bob Ross white base color. Let's see. Where did he call it? Did he just call it white? Oh, he used to call it magic white. He came painting with magic white. Look at that. So like Bob Ross setting up his canvas and then going in and pa painting it magic white. I always think of Van Dyke Brown for some reason. He always used to say Van Dyke Brown. <laughs> I guess he was using that for like the ground and stuff. So if we go ahead and now say create canvas, which is a function call. It's going to basically put that canvas on our easel. And we want to make the canvas the width and the height of the browser window. Now to do that, we can use two built-in variables. So we're going to use window width and window height, all right? I can spell height correctly. And then we're gonna go ahead and paint over that canvas with that white color. Unfortunately, we don't have the magic white, we just have plain white. So we're gonna have to get the spirit of Bob Ross into our P5JS sketch and get some of that magic white. So now let's go ahead and try to run this program and see what happens. Hmm. Now, being that we did paint the background white, this may have actually worked because we can't tell. We just said make it all white. So why don't we, why don't we go back here and let's, for temporarily, let's make it black so that we can see if it worked or not. And look at that. It didn't work. So why didn't it work? What do you think happened here? Let's look at this HTML. We're bringing in one JavaScript file. And look at, let's look at this HTML. What, what do you see that's different here? We're bringing in two JavaScript files here, right? One, the first one we bring in is actually the P5JS library itself. We need that to be able to build any P5JS sketch, right? This is kind of like the foundation that we are standing on top of. Without bringing in that foundation, we have nothing to stand on top of and it's not gonna work, right? It turns out that we actually are still standing on top of a lot of foundation. It's just not P5JS. We need that P5JS. So let's go ahead and bring that bad boy in. And we want to do that right before we are calling our own custom code, which is called platformer, right? Because we want to make sure that that foundation is in place before we execute our JavaScript. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And now if we go, boom, look at that. So we have our black canvas here. And if we inspect that canvas, you'll see we actually have a canvas element that P5JS automatically created for us right within the HTML itself. So that's awesome. Now you may notice something. We have this kind of like margin here around the canvas itself, this white margin. We really don't want that, right? That we could keep that. It just doesn't look too clean and it kind of drives me nuts a little bit. So I think, I think taking that away is something we should probably do. Now that's going to take us into the third component of web development, right? So far we've been working with HTML and we bring it, and we're bringing in JavaScript but to get rid of that margin. We need to work with something called CSS. And we dove a bit into CSS in last semester's class. We looked at layouts. We looked at a couple of different selectors that you can use in CSS to be able to basically style your web applications and websites. So in this case, if we go to the canvas here and we can see that actually it's on the, it's on the body. Uh, look at here. If I click body and you can see here over in the CSS area, the, the browser itself defines a margin of 8px. And you can see that by the user agent style sheet, that means that the user agent, in this case, the user agent is Chrome. Remember, a browser is literally called a user agent on the internet because from a web server's perspective, that is a person itself. So the browser is acting on behalf of a user. So it's, a, it's basically an agent of the user. And we call that a user agent. 
pretty cool. So the user agent has a default style of a margin of 8px on the body. So every single body is going to have this spacing right there. We don't want that. So if we go here to element style, just to see if we can get it out, and we say margin zero, look at that. Everything pops into place all nice, and it's all lined up. So, but if we, if we, if we refresh this, if we refresh this, it's actually keeping that margin in place, which, oh, actually it's not, it just scrolled over. There we go. See, if we refresh it, it goes away. And we, we want it to actually stay there. So let's go back over here. Let's go into our HTML and I'm going to go ahead and let's just put a little bit of CSS up at the top here. We're not going to create a new CSS file because I don't really think we need it. We need it. It's, it's, we just need a little bit of CSS. So I'm going to say, um, we're going to use a style tag and I'm going to give it a type of text slash CSS. And I'm going to close that. And now right within this, I'm going to say body. Whoop, body margin 0px. Now what this did was it basically brought this style sheet, this CSS onto our page without having to put it into a separate file. And this is going to now define the margin on this element to be zero, which should overwrite the default user agent settings. So if we go ahead and refresh this, boom, look at that. It now snaps into place. We have no more margin there. And you can see here, that on plat in platformer.html at on line eight, we define this margin zero and we overrode the body, which is the body that's defined in the user agent style sheet. A, a lot of times in, in industry, you call this a, a reset and there are popular reset CSS uh, style sheets out there that um, do a lot of resetting for us. There are a lot of default styles in the user agent. Things like when you use your header, like a header two or a header one, they come with usually Chrome and many browsers, the user agents that have padding and margins all around them by default. And a lot of times that screws up our, uh, our desired design look when we're designing a, a web application. Folks that don't use a reset, a lot of times they get caught into this situation where they're just really finagling with margins, making negative margins and, and trying to get things to fit properly when they could have really just started off with a proper reset. And now you have a, a, a good, again, going back to that foundation, a good foundation to work off of. In this case, we're referring to CSS. So now we have this nice clean CSS. We can go ahead and close our console for now and reset, reload our browser, and we should have a beautiful plain black screen. Awesome. Okay, so now let's keep going here. In our platformer, I'm gonna go ahead and instead of a white, a black background, I'm gonna use a white background. Now let's go ahead and define our second function. Now notice how I came out of this function. So I am outside of this curly bracket here. All the code that lives in here is within the setup and all the code outside of it is not in the setup. But now we want to define our draw function. So I'm going to do the same thing. Say function draw. And now I'm inside of that draw function. Now what I want to do is let's go ahead and let's just make sure everything's working properly. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, we don't wanna fill, no fill. And we're gonna say, uh, give us a stroke of, whoops. Oh, that's a bad. Um, auto complete, we're gonna say stroke. I don't want you to auto complete that editor. That's not nice. Stroke of say, let's make it, And then we're gonna say ellipse. And let's make an ellipse at a random X and Y coordinate. So we're gonna say ellipse at random um, window width and then comma random window height. And we'll give it a, let's, Let's just go random all around. We'll give it a random value between zero and 500. 
Now, what we're expecting here is that we're going to see random circles drawn to the screen with just a blue outline on each one of them. So let's go ahead and refresh this and look at that. Boom. We got all these different size circles just randomly drawing everywhere. So we should be able to get to this point together. We should have random circles drawing to the screen. Just making sure that my browser is still being recorded here in the Zoom call. Looking good. Okay. So what I want to do now is I just want to review some of the information that we, um, that we have in our first assignment here, which is basically to create a, a program that uses loops and conditionals. Now, technically, this is actually using a loop because the draw function is called in a loop. So this draw function is called 30 times per second inside of a loop. We just don't see this loop, right? This loop is outside of our, our, our visual because it's the framework that's calling into this, into this loop, right? Into this draw function. What we wanna do is we wanna actually write our own loop, right? So instead of maybe doing this here, I'm gonna go ahead and cut these lines and let's go back into our setup function right here. And we're gonna use a loop to draw random circles. Now, if we put this line of code right here, just as we had it, right? What do we expect to see? Are we gonna see random circles being drawn to the screen over and over again? Now remember, our setup function only executes one time. So how many times are we going to see this on the screen, which is basically drawing a circle? Exactly one time. So let's go ahead back here. And there we go. We have one circle here. Now, if we refresh this, it is going to be random because we are drawing this at random places, but it's only going to be one circle because we took it outside of that loop, out of that draw loop. Now, if we wanted to control this within the setup function and not have this kind of animating, continuously drawing circle, we can put this inside of a loop inside of the setup function. Now we're getting crazy. So let's go ahead and give that a shot. So there are a bunch of different types of loops that we can use. In this case, I'm going to use what's called a for loop. And I'm going to say four. Now, a for loop uses uh, what's called a, a basically a looping variable or an iterator to be able to keep track of where it is in the loop. So we're going to say let i equal zero, which is going to be our looping variable. And I'm going to say I, we're going to loop for as long as i is less than or equal to, let's say, 100. And then for each loop, we're going to increment it by one. And we're going to open up our curly brackets. So this right here is the basic pattern of creating a loop. It's pretty simple. There's three parts to it. There's the initialization, which we say we want to initialize i at zero. And then there's the rule, the termination rule, in which we're going to say, when should the loop stop looping? In this case, we're saying, hey, we're going to stop looping when i is less, it is we're going to, oh, I'm actually going to continue to loop as long as i is less than or equal to 100. So it's going to go from zero to 100. So how many times is it going to loop? 101 times, right? Because we start at zero and we're going up to 100. So zero counts here. So it's going to loop 101 times. And then we're going to increment by one each time by saying i plus plus. Now, let's see what happens here. Hmm. Okay. It's not drawing that circle where we want it. What the heck, man? What's wrong here? Do you guys see what's wrong? Okay. I think you guys see this. So these lines of code need to be inside the loop, just like we're putting code inside a function, 
right? Every time you see these curly brackets, we have a new code block, right? And every piece of code inside of this code block, which is inside of the for loop, is going to be executed every time the for loop ex it loops. So in this case, these lines of code are going to be executed 101 times. So if we go back here, boom, there we go. We have 101 circles on the screen. Let's sit here and count each one of them together. One, two, I'm playing, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> uh, let's, let's lower this number a little bit and let's just to prove it out. So let's go and go to five. So we should loop basically six times. So four here, five, six. Look at that. A little easier to count those. So that is a loop. Now, we also want to use a conditional statement, right? So to use a conditional statement, we want to basically say, if something is of some value, then do something else, right? The basic if-then statement, right? So what we can do is, um, just for, for example purposes here, we're going to use a conditional statement inside of this for loop to basically change the color of the circle depending on where it lives on the screen. Okay, so let's go ahead and try to do that together. So let's say, for example, we wanted to say if, if a circle is being drawn above a certain value, then make it say blue. If it's below a certain value, let's make it red. So what we'll do is instead of just throwing the width and the height into this random function, every time we loop, let's go ahead and grab these. And every time we loop, we're gonna go ahead and use a variable. Let's say let x equals random width, and then let's say let y equal random height, right? And now here, instead of having these values, random width and random height, we're gonna go ahead and give it an x and a y. We're gonna use those variables that we just defined. So this is going to do the same exact thing, right? Nothing changed here. We're just storing these random values in a variable and then using the variables when we call the function. But it gives us a, a bit of a superpower now because we now have the capabilities to test what the values of X and Y are before we actually use them. So what we can do is we can actually before we do this stroke command or function call, I'm going to take that out and I'm going to say if x say is greater than um, window width divided by two. So what I'm saying here is if, if the x value is basically on the right side of the screen, then we're going to make the stroke blue. Now we're going to say if x is less than, we could probably also use an else here, but I'm going to be explicit here. If x is less than window width divided by two, then the stroke is going to be red. Let's see what happens. Nothing, we have the white screen of death. So what did we do wrong? Let's go to our inspector and go to our console. Window, uh, what, what did I type there? I typed with with, that's not right. So let's go here and let's see, where did we type that? With with, <laughs> we wanna make it window with. There we go. So now if we go back here, let's go ahead and refresh this. Look at that. So now all of the circles drawn over here are going to be blue and all of the circles drawn over here are going to be red. If we keep refreshing that, you can see how we're kind of splitting the screen up here with different colors. Now maybe just to make sure it actually comes over on this, I'm gonna, instead of stroke, I'm gonna say fill. And fill. 
And instead of no fill, I'm just going to take this out. I'm going to say no stroke. We don't want to stroke on our circles. And now we have this kind of like crazy random background going on here. It's actually kind of cool looking. I'm, I'm a fan of this. Actually, on my personal website, I use this exact technique. Just have a really basic website here. And I put a little random circle generator right here, which I kind of like the whole kind of simplistic look of it. Um, so it's kind of cool looking. You could, I, I could see a website where you put like a little like business card style right in the center here using a, a little flex box layout, like hi, my name is, and it's a nice little portfolio site or something like that. So that's that. Now, that's basically a quick overview of conditional statements and loops. So I kind of, I, I would pause on this screen right here and get this working within your environments. And if you have not done so already, please submit um, your assignment for this uh, to create a program using loops and conditionals. Um, Cause I do want to progress pretty quickly into other aspects of this uh, specifically to create an actual platformer. So, I'm gonna go ahead and move this code. I'm gonna create another file here and I'm just gonna call it, um, what, did we, what did we say in the assignment here? I'm gonna go, uh, okay, I didn't actually declare uh, what the file name should be. So I'm just gonna call it uh, loops and conditionals.js. And I'm gonna go ahead and just take this, copy it, and paste it in here so that we have that code here. I'll probably organize some of this stuff in maybe a future, future lesson, but it's all good. We'll keep it here for now. Now, let's talk about this platformer a little bit. So what I'd like to do is I'd really like to get to the point where we can control a character and walk that character across the screen. And then eventually introduce things like obstacles and, and possibly an enemy or two. So there are a couple of things to keep in mind. Again, you can, you can work on this in a small group up to three if you choose. Um, what I would like you guys to do is we can all collaboratively communicate right within Schoology using the, um, uh, the forums. Specifically, we have the, um, just pulling it up on another screen here, we have the where is the, oh, here it is, the ask a question forum. Uh, I'd love to see a little bit more traffic in there with you guys asking questions about specific things. Um, for these types of projects, I think it's gonna become necessary for us to, to start to collaborate on there. Um, so what I'd like to do is get to the point where we can develop a platformer. Now, instead of jumping right into code, right, which is uh, a lot of times when you're working on a project, that's probably not the right thing to do. We want to think about a little bit of what we're trying to create, right? And to do that, I like to use prototyping tools. And one that I really enjoy using is called Figma. And this is a really cool tool, especially now that we're all kind of remote. Uh, to be able to collaboratively de de design things. You can think of this almost like Photoshop, but in your browser, but much simpler and really f catered towards um, more uh, interface design, UX, UI design. But we can use it to prototype maybe what we think a basic game should look like. So I'm actually going to go ahead and sign up for an account here. And I encourage you guys to do the same. I'm going to sign up with my uh, FTC edu account and we go ahead and create an account and I'm going to say my name and we do software development and I don't want to join the, the mailing list. Let's go ahead and create that account. Now what you guys can do, if you guys go ahead and create a, an account too, this is completely free. There's no cost. Um, we can actually, you can share these with me and we can collaborate together. So give your team a name. Let's call our team DC Codes. Next, and I don't want to choose starter. No thanks. Okay. So now this is the basic interface. I'm not gonna go too much into like how to use this tool. It's, it's pretty self-explanatory in, in terms of just tooling around here with 
different things. But one thing you want to do is you want to create a new frame and then create a page within that frame. So we're going to go ahead and new. And I'm going to call this, you can click right up here. I'm going to say platformer proto type. And let's go ahead and create a page. Oh. And now within the page, I'm sorry, I think I said it backwards. Within the page, we need to add, ah, this is like really small on my screen here. So I'm going to create a frame. And now the frame over here can be different screen sizes. So let me see if I can zoom in a little bit because this is actually small on my screen. If it's just not, uh, yeah, look at that. So it's zooming in, but it's not Figma like took over my zoom functions. So mm. This is getting in the way right now. Let me uh, go ahead and go back to page one and I'm gonna add a new frame and we're just gonna give it a desktop frame. Here we go. So get this guy out of here. We don't need this guy. And let's go ahead and zoom out. Okay, cool. So now we have a basic desktop uh, size here. And really what I'm thinking we do, and this is gonna be a really simple uh, prototype, but what I'd like to do is draw the ground first. So we want to draw a ground and let's go ahead and draw a rectangle right here. And we'll make this rectangle green. And some green color. We can make like nice dark green. And then we want to draw a character, but we want to make sure that the character, in this case, we'll make the character just a simple circle. All right. We want to make sure the character hits this floor floor right here. So maybe start the character up here and let it drop to the floor. And then when it drops to the floor, we want it to stop because it's like colliding with the floor. So we want it to just stick right there, right? So this is basically a probably an okay prototype to start, right? So this is how a lot of times ideas start to formulate, right? We we start with this very, very basic. You know, if you, if you showed any one of your friends or family or, or, or colleagues, they're going to be like, what, what did, a, did a child do this? This doesn't make any sense. What's, what's going on? Like, are, you, are you going insane? I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> but this is how these ideas start to formulate. If we, if we can get a ball, a basic geometric shape to interact with a rectangle, we can easily replace these shapes with other assets, other images that maybe we created someplace else, like a nice Photoshop image of a character um, or a nice ground image of, you know, kind of a leafy bottom or something like that. So starting here is really an important step. And as you're going to see, once we get into the code, this is, there's a lot of code that we're going to write here to be able to just get this to, to just sit on the floor, right? So let's go ahead and let's start to, to scaffold out the, the environment here. And you know what? I should keep a track on time because I can go forever on this and I don't want to make these, these way too long, but we do want to get a little bit of this platformer in. So I'm going to go ahead back to our platform, platformer JS. I'm going to delete pretty much everything in the setup and we're going to get back to this basic setup and draw flow. Now we have this create canvas and we have this background white. That's it. So now if we go back to here, we should just see a white, just nothing, right? So now what I wanna do is I want to quickly review object-oriented programming. So in order for us to start to create these objects in our game, right? In this case, ah, this, uh, this screen sharing is getting in my way. So in order to create what we see here, this basic prototype, we have two objects on the screen, right? 
And when we talk about an object, we talk about something that we can literally describe in, in real life. Anything in real life can be an object, right? I, I, I always talk about the trees and stuff. Trees can be an object. Um, you know, your phone is an object. Your hand is an object. Um, I'm just looking at things at my desk right now. The phone is an object, right? Um, everything is an object that we can describe. And objects have different properties, right? Like my phone case is an object and it's black, right? That's a, that's a property of my phone case, right? It could also have different methods. The methods are functions within that object that give it functionality. For example, my phone has maybe um, the ability to swipe up and unlock the screen. That's a method. That's a function that my phone exposes, right? So let's go ahead back into our our platformer here and let's define our first object. Now we, we define objects by providing the system with blueprints and we call these blueprints classes. So I'm going to go ahead and, and define a new class outside of our setup and draw function and I'm going to call this class ground. Now just like you open up any code block you're going to go ahead and open up with those curlies and now in order for us to create the ground we need to include a, a fixed method called the constructor. And this constructor is defined, constructor, if I could spell it right, constructor is basically a function, but this function is automatically called when we build this blueprint, right? So I'm gonna say here, console.log new ground. Now we're gonna do the same exact thing I'm going to copy this entire thing and then I'm going to go here to and paste it right below it. Instead of ground, I'm going to call it character. And then instead of new ground, I'm going to say new character. Now I'm moving a little faster here, but flow with me. So if, if I go ahead, I'm just going to separate this with a little comment so that you can see the separation of these different classes. Now we've defined two blueprints. They're basically the same, we just name them differently. So we have a ground and we have a character. If we go back to our simple prototype here, we have this ground and we have the character. Okay, cool. So now we have these things defined, how do we actually use them? In order to use them, we need to build them and construct them, right? Basically we call it constructing. So up here at the top, we're going to create two global variables. We're going to say let character, all lowercase. Um, we're not going to define it yet. And we're going to say let ground. And we're not going to define it yet. Now in our setup function, so right here, we're going to say character equal new character with an uppercase C, open close parentheses. And then we're going to say ground equal new ground uppercase G. Oh, now here, this is where we constructed, we were constructing our objects. So basically the classes turned into constructed objects here and they're stored in this variable. Remember variables hold information for us. Right? We can hold basic information like a number or a string of letters like somebody's name, but we can also hold more complex data structures like objects. And these objects have within them properties and methods. Those properties define different attributes about that object, like its color and size. And then the methods manipulate the properties inside them, like the color and size, or maybe position, right? So if we're gonna use position, a position would be a, a property and then to move would be a method. So we would say move and that move method would manipulate the position properties. You flowing with me? I know I'm going on. I'll pause for a second, take a look at this code. We've got two classes or two blueprints. One defines the character, one defines the ground. Now, being that we're calling new here, that means that the constructor is being called. And because we're doing a console log, that means that the output 
we should see some output on our console when this executes. So let's go ahead and go over to here and I'm gonna open up that console again. And look at that, new character and new ground. We don't see anything yet because we're not actually drawing anything, but we do have the character and the ground available. So let's go ahead and let's try to get something to, to draw here. So drawing, just like moving, would be what? Would it be a method or would it be a property? It's manipulating something, right? So drawing is actually going to do something. So it would be a method. So ground, let's go ahead inside of our ground blueprint or class. We're gonna say draw. And that's it. We're going to just define this. We don't have to say function draw because we're within the context of a class. This, was, this is what makes it a method. And now within draw, we can actually go ahead and draw something. So we could say maybe fill, let's speak. Now some of the autocomplete is a little, little weird in this editor. So bear with it. If it, oops. I say fill here and it tries to do an autocomplete. You can hit back on the keyboard and then forward again. And that will kind of just short circuit that autocomplete. I'm gonna say fill and let's make it green. And then I'm gonna make a rectangle. I'm gonna make a rectangle and, oh man, that's a, I'm gonna make a rectangle and we're gonna make the rectangle, I'm gonna to have to pull up the reference here. Just popping over to the re uh, reference here and looking at the parameters, we have the X and Y and the width and the height. Okay, so let's make the X and the Y. Uh, we wanna make the Y a little further down so it's more of a, you know, a ground, but we'll make the X zero because we want it to start all the way over to the left-hand side. And then the Y, let's go ahead and make, um, Let's try just 200 for now. We'll make it. We'll make it a little more dynamic in a minute. And then the width. The other. Uh, the width and the height. Let's go ahead and make the width is going to be the entire width of the screen. So we're going to say window width, and the height. Let's make a hundred. And let's see what happens there. If we go here, we're not going to see anything yet, right? Because why? We're not actually calling the draw method. To call this, we need to call it someplace. So we can call it right in the setup. We could say ground, ground dot draw, All right? And now if we go here, look at that. We have a ground, but it's not exactly on the ground. Let's go ahead and change that. So let's see. We've got this Y at the, let's make it the window height, right? We're using our internal variables. Now, if we make it the window height, we're probably not gonna see anything because it's actually drawn below the window now. So we have to offset it a bit. So let's go ahead and offset it by say 100, right? Which is the height that we've defined. So 100, 100. And now if we go back here, boom, we should see a ground that is always going to line up with the actual ground of the window size. No, so no matter how, no matter what size your window is, this is going to be the ground. Now I notice there's a little black stroke here. I don't want that black stroke. Let's go ahead and say stroke. And now we have no black stroke there. And we have a little ground. Look at that. Pixel perfect, baby. Look at that. It's looking like our prototype. All right, so now let's go ahead and draw our character. So what are we going to do to draw our character? We're going to do the same thing, right? We're going to go ahead and take this draw function. We're going to copy it and let's paste it here right in our character class. And I'm going to make the fill of this say white and we'll give it a stroke of black and instead of a rectangle we're going to go ahead and make a ellipse we'll say 10 10 10 just to get some output 
And now, is anything going to happen here? Are we going to draw the character at all? We're not, right? Because we did not call the draw method on the character. So let's go ahead in our setup function and let's go ahead and call the character draw. Now, we should see a character. Oh, look at that, a little guy right up there. There he is, you can hardly see him. He's all the way up there. So now, now that we have this guy up here, we want to move him down a bit. So we're going to move him down to say, let's take him down to window height minus 100. And let's make him a little bigger. Let's make him 200. And let's see where he's sitting now. Oh, put him in the wrong spot. Instead of 10, whoops, we're going to say, because this is X, we want to keep X to the left. We'll make it window height. There we go. This will move it down. There we go. Look at that. He's down there a little bit. Now I'm going to fake this for the time being. I'm going to say being that it's 20, we'll, we'll take it back another. We're going the wrong way. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. 120. All right, maybe 140. Nope. 100 puts it on it a little bit. Let's, I'm just kind of messing around with numbers here to get it to line up. And there we go, it doesn't look that bad. Okay, so we don't have any real collision detection in yet. We just literally placed this right there. Um, in the next lesson, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually figure out how to start this bad boy, say here at, at, at some random height. And then we're gonna drop this character and the character is gonna land on the ground. And then we're gonna learn how to move the character around and use a little bit of what we call vectors and forces to be able to move this guy around using some basic physics. Very similar to what we did in the last project of the first semester, but we're gonna build on these ideas a bit more to be able to add forces together. So it's gonna be pretty cool. All right guys, so get to this point. So the assignment for this week is basically to get to this point right here, post a link to your environments right to your platform or HTML. And again, you guys can work in teams if you choose, you don't have to, but please use the ask a question section here to, to collaborate, ask any questions about um, the project. And if you wanted to try to build more upon that, I definitely encourage you guys to move forward if you can. Um, any questions, you know where to find me. All right, guys, have fun. Thanks.